that, that attack down there that hasn't yet been blocked by the phishing filter, you can pretty easily see that even though there's paypal.com within the address bar, there's also fisher.org, and fisher.org is the part that's in black. So, you know, this kind of stuff seems pretty obvious, but it turns out that for some users, this isn't gonna help them at all either. And, you know, we've, we found this out. We, went, we did a living with Vista study. We went out to a user's, a user's uh, family and, you know, we talked to them and uh, we, we saw how they used the browser. And we noticed what they did is every time they booted the browser, they'd go to a web search engine and in the search box, they'd type the URL of where they were going to go and then hit go and then they'd click on the first link. And we said, well, why do you do that? And they said, because that's how we surf the internet. And we said, well, there's this box up here at the top. It's called the address bar. Type the URLs in there and you just go straight there. They said, oh, we never noticed that before. Well, first we were kind of shocked, but we actually did some studies and found, huh, some users don't actually notice the address bar at all. But furthermore, that creates a problem, right? The user doesn't even know to look at the address. There's no hope of doing anything in the address bar that's going to help the user. So we said, okay, we obviously need to continue our investments. Now, we also did EV certificates. You know, lights up the address bar in green. This has been ported into other popular browsers. Uh, I think there's like 7,000 now extended validation certificates issued to date. But again, you've got the problem of non-technical user, you know, look for the green address bar is easier than, you know, look for the domain name that you trust. But still, it's not as easy as we would like. Smart screen. So smart screen is the evolution of the Internet Explorer 7 phishing filter. The phishing filter was a URL reputation-based system that would flag known malicious phishing sites that were trying to harvest your credentials. Well, it turns out that harvesting your credentials is only half the thing that malicious sites would try and do. The other thing they would try and do is try to get you to install software that would otherwise uh, imperil your computer. And so Internet Explorer Smart Screen introduces a new URL reputation-based anti-malware system that works in concert with things like Defender, OneCare, your antivirus, SpyBot, etc to help protect you from malicious software, but it's URL reputation based. And we'll get to why that's important in a minute. The other thing that we've done is we've inter introduced some new telemetry options out of the smart screen filter to make sure that we can block phishing sites more quickly because quickness is everything when it comes to phishing. Average phishing sites are live less than two days. The sooner you get those sites blocked, the more customers you save. We've also introduced group policy control that puts admins in control of the policy. So they can actually say for their organization, we actually trust the smart screen filter. We don't want to allow the user the ability to override warnings because users will shoot themselves in the foot given the option. Quick little sidebar here, lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. One of the things that we see happen a lot is people do benchmarking studies. They say, oh, well, we compared the five following phishing filters and we found that N was the most effective and X was the least effective and here's the number of sites they saw and the number of sites they didn't see. Metrics are really hard. You can look to the antivirus industry for this. What's the most effective AV package? Well, it turns out what you're measuring. What's the most phishing, effective phishing package? It turns out what you're measuring. You've got to look very closely at the methodology for these studies to see what they protect against. A lot of the studies, basically what they'll do is they'll go out and they have a, they've basically got a, a harvest mailbox where they harvest fish emailed to them and uh, they basically, they take that as their input set and then they go run it through all the phishing filters and they see how each one did. The problem is phishing has become a lot more broad than that over the past couple of years. We're seeing things like phishing attacks being spread by messenger, uh, messenger clients. We've seen things like phishing attacks being spread by social networks. That's the one that's going up a ton. And so as the vectors change, the methodology becomes critically important. So how do we measure? We essentially measure based on how many attempted navigations to malicious sites did we block a week? Now, it varies actually pretty wildly depending on what campaigns are in the wild, but so far the IE7 phishing filter blocks more than a million navigations to malicious sites per week. And so that's a pretty good number. We think the number is going to go up quite a bit with IE8 because it turns out malware and malicious downloads are way more prevalent than anyone realized. The other thing we did is we improved the UI. We're trying to get to that alligator effect where you look at the boat full of alligators and you say, you know what, I'm really not going to go there. So this error page used to intentionally look a lot like the IE connection pages, you know, it was all the same designer, it just kind of had a subtle, subtle uh, red tint to it. We've made it way more bold. We simplified the, the advice to users. Uh, we've given them something else to do, go back to your home page instead for the users who don't really get browsing and they just like to click on stuff. And then for the IT admin, we've given them the ability to actually remove that disregarding continue link. 
So you can basically say, you know what? It's my network, you're on your work machine. You can't install malware even if you want to. And so this is one of the top things that, that IT admins have, have asked for. Uh, I've got a quick screenshot of telemetry. One of the things we can do is if we, if we see suspicious things in the system, new website comes out of nowhere, tons of new users hitting it, there's things heuristically that are fishy about it, we can actually ask a certain subset of users, hey, is this really the site you thought it was? Users can vote. That vote goes into the grading system, and then we can prioritize the, the work of the human graders so we can get those phishing sites taken down faster. Now, social engineering. Downloads can be useful is what this dialogue shows. You know? Wow, that's, that's really great advice. Kind of reminds me of this thing I saw on a beach in Hawaii. Basically, on one side it says, uh, danger, no swimming. And on the other side it says, if in doubt, don't go out. Seems kind of conflicting advice. Go out, but don't swim. So it's, uh, it's a case where, you know, they don't know. You know, maybe you're an expert, you know, Olympic swim swimmer, and, you know, you're fine. But on the other hand, you're probably not, so let's tell you not to go out. So we kind of have that conflicting thing in the download dialogue of, you know, downloads can be useful, but they can also destroy your computer. So what we've done, you know, and this, is, this was one of the, the, the warnings I thought was more effective. Basically, they just have a running tally of the number of people who died. And, uh, you know, in some cases, that's pretty easy because, you know, you say, wow, uh, you know, when I walked by that sign, the only thing I thought was, I don't want to be the next scratch on that sign. And so, you know, what can we do? And again, basically, we can make this much, much bolder. And so in IE8, when you, down, when you visit a site that's known to distribute malware and you attempt to do a download, uh, the download dialogue is completely interrupted. We say, hey, this download's been reported as unsafe. Uh, the default is, is that the download is aborted. We do this reputation check both for file downloads and for ActiveX installations. So if there's a malicious ActiveX control out there, we can do the same thing. And then again, we have group policy there that allows to take the decision out of the hands of the end user and put the IT admin in charge. And that was one of the top things that they requested after IE7 is, hey, I don't ever want my user to make a security decision. I want to make the security decision for them. And so using group policy as an IT administrator, you can turn off the user's ability to override things like cer certificate errors, uh, you can block insecure content, you can turn on the, the smart screen filter and not allow the user to override its blocks, uh, and you can regulate which ActiveX controls are allowed to run and where. And so altogether there's 1,300 group policies that put you as an IT administrator in charge of what your users can do. Now lastly, and in some respects the most interesting stuff, the web app vulnerabilities. You know, Jeremiah has talked this morning, super popular. It's an awesome exploit. You know, there's so many different ways that things come together and put the user at risk. And as more and more interesting content moves to the internet, the, the incentive for attackers to find these things is ever greater. So this is a, a, a pivot of one of the slides from the White Hat Security Report. Basically, likelihood of a, a given, applica uh, given web application containing a given vulnerability. XSS, again, off the charts. So, XSS, what can you do with it? Who cares? You know, some people don't understand XSS. XSS is the new buffer overflow, uh, Brian Sullivan likes to say. And the reason he says that is not because they have much in common with buffer overflows in terms of the exploit itself, but rather because of what you can do with it. As more and more applications move to the web, XSS is how you get arbitrary code execution in someone else's web application. Once you have arbitrary code execution inside someone else's web application, you can do all kinds of badness. So XSS threats are a web-sized vulnerability, but because the web vulnerability has to be exploited through the browser in order for it to be useful, we in the browser have the opportunity to do something about it. The way the XSS filter works, this flowchart's a little too small to see, but basically what we do is we look to see whether a navigation is going cross-domain. If a navigation is going cross-domain, we look to see what's going out with the navigation. Is there a script in the URL or in the post body? Simple enough. One approach would be, okay, if so, stop here. Problem is it doesn't work. It kind of breaks the internet when you do that. Because it turns out that lots of things pass script, or things that look exactly like script, in innocuous ways. They either pass it to themselves, or maybe it's a submit a script database where you go share JavaScript source code with other people. If you just prevent that outbound post, well, hmm, kind of broke that site completely. People will say, oh, don't upgrade to IE8. It breaks our site. Hmm, what can we do? So rather than blocking it completely, what we do is we generate a signature out of it. We heuristically look for the things that, that could be executable script, and we take note of them. And then we, what we do is we actually wait for the reflection. 
we wait for the server to send back the response page, and we look to see in the response page, was that script reflected back to the user in a way that it's going to execute? And if so, we modify it. Specifically, we neuter characters out of it. So in the case here, basically, we've got this uh, hacker site you know, demo there, and we generated a script signature saying, hey, if you see an outbound get request or post request that contains script source equals, then generate a signature off of that and look for that response in the body. And if it's found, then sanitize it so that it doesn't execute. Now the key point in here is we sanitize it so it doesn't execute. We don't throw the user to an error page. We don't ask them to decide. We just do it, and we do it in a way that most likely the page won't break. We actually had a false positive. We, used to, we had a bug in beta 2 where if you go to Amazon and you do one-click checkout, it turns out that, that goes across domain. We sanitize something in a way that's, you know, a way that's not supposed to because it wasn't really going cross domain, it was just crossing protocols. And so, false positive, terrible. Why aren't people saying don't use IE8 beta? Because it turns out it was entirely innocuous. So we sanitized part of the response page. That part of the page wasn't ever used by the customer in any meaningful way. So they'd get this gold bar saying, hey, you know, we saw some possible cross-site scripting and we changed it. But for the normal user, they don't care. Nothing has changed about their web experience. We've just presented the possibility of code execution. So we continue to tune the heuristics. The false positive rate on this thing is just tiny. And so that's why we, we, you know, we're proud of the XSS filter because we can turn it on by default. There's lots of security add-ons for different browsers that allow you to mitigate this type of thing, sort of. But you get lots of prompts. You have to make decisions. Your websites may not work anymore. This is something that's safe enough that we can turn on for the web by default. Then a bunch of other work to help at reduce attack surface against other types of cross-site scripting attacks. Most of this is the technical geeky stuff that you know, the guys writing cross-site scripting filters in the server side of content get excited about. Turned off the US ASCII code page. We don't sniff UTF-7. We don't do care set inheritance across, uh, across iframes that are cross domain. We fix code page related bugs. CSS expressions are disabled in IE8 standards mode. Big attack surface reduction. And we've introduced a bunch of new AJAX features that ena more, enable more secure mashups. We've added new native JSON support. So native JSON support is great because what you can do, the, the dominant, one of the dominant ways of exchanging data on the web today is in JavaScript object notation format. Basically, a JavaScript object you can pretty easy, easily serialize into a string. You know? The problem is people use this to pass data between applications cross domain. The primary way that people revive these strings back into JavaScript is by calling the eval function. What happens if you call eval on executable code? It runs. The native JSON stuff enables us to parse things directly into JavaScript objects while dropping all of the executable functionality out of them. Now you can exchange a, a string of JavaScript object notation cross domain and then revive it without the possibility of that other domain getting code to run in your domain. Another thing we've done on top of that is what's called two static HTML. Two static HTML uses the Microsoft anti cross site scripting library, which used to only be available on the server side. We've moved it to the client, so it's a function on the window. So now you can have an AJAX application where you pass it a dangerous string of content. In this case, it's supposed to be some simple HTML, but there's a script lock embedded in it. When you run it through the two static HTML function, we strip out the scripts and we strip out dangerous CSS styles. So now you can have an AJAX application that doesn't have to hit the server to get these protections. This helps mitigate against other types of cross-site scripting attacks, the type 0 attacks and the type 2 attacks. Now, passing strings between domains. The primary way to communicate between domains today in mashups is, hey, just put my script source into your page. You know, you want my ad on your page, just do script source equals bigadvertiser.com, whack pagead2.js. Well, that gives that big advertiser the ability to run arbitrary JavaScript within your page. We've introduced new ways for sites that want to communicate to communicate safely. We've introduced cross-document messaging. Cross-document messaging is the post message feature of HTML5. It allows you to pass strings between frames in ways where it's more secure because both the, the origin and the destination are checked against what's expected. You can further secure cross-document messaging by passing the output through either two or, uh, to the JSON parsing functions or two static HTML. So basically, you can go ask this other, this other security principle, hey, give me a string of something that you want, and then you can sanitize it and use it more safely. We've also introduced the X domain request object. The X domain request object is competitive to the cross-site XML HTTP proposal that's before the HTML5 working group today. The reason we did X domain request is we looked at cross-site XML HTTP request 
We looked at the history of building cross-site communication with 